This video will review matter, specifically the physical and chemical properties and changes of matter. Just to review the definition for matter, it's anything that has mass and takes up space, which is the vast majority of anything you can think of in our universe. Um, it's a lot harder to think of something that does not qualify as matter, um, and that would be things, sources of energy like light, heat, those are not matter. But almost anything else you can think of um, classifies as matter. I would like you to take a look at the um, boxes at the bottom here um, and be able to interpret them because it's likely you'll have a question similar to this on a quiz or a test. So note in the box to the far left represents a, an element, atoms of an element. Um, they're all single balls representing single atoms. There are no chemical bonds in place and it's pure. The second box, um, also a pure substance because all of the substances look the same. However, it's clear that there are two atoms now bonded together. Um, so this is still an element because it, it consists of only one type of atom, but the atoms uh, exist as pairs rather than as singlets. The third box, represents molecules and you you can tell that mainly because the balls that make up the substances are two different colors representing two different elements chemically bonded. It still is a pure substance because everything in the box looks identical to one another. So it is a pure substance but it's a compound. And finally the box to the far right is a mixture. It has some single atom elements it has some diatomic elements and it has some compounds all mixed together. All right, so what are the definitions of an atom, molecule, compound, and mixture? What might throw you off is the difference between a molecule and a compound. It's almost kind of a trivial difference, but it is different. So let's see, look at compare boxes. Sorry for my dogs. B and C to get an idea of the difference between a molecule and a compound. What do you see as the difference there? They both have chemical bonds. They both have multiple atoms within each unit of a substance. The difference is that a compound has at least two different atoms chemically bonded, whereas a molecule has all of the same type of an element bonded. So let's look at the formal definitions. All right, so I think we know what an atom is. Uh, it's the building block of matter. A molecule is when two or more atoms chemically bond, okay? Um, these atoms have to be the same in order to be called a molecule. If the atoms are different, instead of a molecule, we call it a compound. Why do we care about the um, structure and classification of matter? <clears throat> well, knowing that tells us all about the properties that we can expect from the atoms and molecules. And the properties of atoms on the microscale tells us what the properties of that material will be on a macroscale. What did I just say? Well, for example, if you look at the properties of a water molecule, that will tell you how you would expect bulk water to behave. Water in a glass, for example, or in a pan. So it's important to understand the molecular level. Um, for example, I just thought these were kind of cool examples. So aluminum is an atom, it's an element, and it's used like crazy in our everyday life. Aluminum foil is probably the most common use. Um, we can understand the structure and properties of the element aluminum and that will give us an idea of what it might be useful for in our lives and that's how they decided they if you take the element aluminum it's very bendable which we call malleable uh, very lightweight so it's used in building racing bikes and things um, water um, in order to understand its crazy properties, like it'll dissolve almost anything, it's got an incredibly high surface tension, which allows things like water bugs and paper clips to float on top of it, even though it's a liquid. 
And all of that, all of those properties can be explained by looking at the structure of water molecule on a molecular level. All right, so most of the time we're going to talk about changes. We're going to distinguish physical changes from chemical changes. But first, let's understand properties. What is the difference between a physical property and a chemical property? A physical property is any property that you can observe without destroying the substance. So you can observe color, odor, hardness. You can even observe boiling point and melting point because you can boil or melt something without destroying it. If you melt an ice cube to make observations, you still have H2O. You have not destroyed the substance. So those are physical properties. A chemical property, things like how flammable is this material, how um, reactive is this material, how prone is this material to rust. The only way you can make that observation of a chemical property is by actually chemically changing or destroying the substance. So if you want to see how flammable a substance is, you've got to try to light it on fire and in that process you've destroyed it. So a chemical property can only be observed by actually destroying it. Alright, <clears throat> now let's talk about changes. You're going to need to, the bottom line is you're going to need to be able to understand the difference between um, a physical change and a chemical change. So I might give you 20 different examples and you would have to classify them. The main question you have to ask yourself is if the change does not change the composition of the substance, it's a physical change. So if you were to cut a piece of paper or rip it into shreds, that is a physical change because you still have the chemical makeup of the paper, which is cellulose. You have not broken any chemical bonds. If you melt or boil something, it is a physical change. Again, if you melt or boil water, you still have H2O. You have not broken any chemical bonds. Those are physical changes. Chemical change, you always make a new substance. Always, always, always make a new substance. So some examples of chemical changes would be combustion, burning, um, rusting, decomposition. And so, for example, leaves changing color. That is a chemical reaction going on inside the leaf. Cooking food, most of the time, the vast majority of the time, is a chemical change. Tarnishing of anything, pennies, silver, rusting of your bicycle, those are all chemical changes. And of course, burning is a chemical change. Now that we've talked about changes, we're going to talk about classification of matter. So take a look for a minute at this concept map because this is something you'll likely have to uh, be able to create on your own. I'll talk about it a little bit more, but may, you may want to jot it down. So there are two ways to classify matter. The first way is by the state of matter. Is it a solid, liquid, or gas? And of course, the fourth state of matter is plasma which we won't talk too much about at this point. So if you classify matter by the state that it's in, um, whether it's a gas, solid, or liquid, it's important to know the phase change names. I think you're familiar with all of these, perhaps not as much with deposition. Make sure you know the names of all these phase changes. So while sublimation is when we go directly from a solid to a gas without passing through the liquid, Deposition is the reverse, so it's when you have a gas and it goes directly to the solid state without going through the liquid. You can also classify matter or a substance by the composition. So these different boxes on this concept map show different compositions. For example, do you have a mixture or do you have a pure substance? And then we can subclassify it once we have that determined. If you don't remember the properties of gas, liquid, and solids from all your years of science classes, um, quickly review. But uh, in quick summary, a solid material uh, is a very tight, the molecules or atoms are very tightly packed to one another. The only type of movement a solid undergoes is vibration. It's too tightly packed for any other type of movement. And uh, a liquid, the, the particles, atoms and molecules are still pretty close to one another, but they do have room to slide past each other, okay? 
So the fact that the molecules and atoms slide past each other is why a liquid can be poured or can flow. And finally, gas. Total freedom of movement of the atoms and particles of a gas. Uh, they're spaced quite a bit farther apart. There's uh, Actually, a gas is mostly empty space. Um, and because of that, a gas is the only phase of matter that is substantially compressible. So that's an important thing to know. A gas is the only phase of matter that is significantly compressible. It can be squeezed to a smaller volume. All right, there are two types of solid matter, and I meant to make a subtitle here and I forgot to. So we have crystals, crystalline materials that are solid, and we have what's called amorphous solids. The I always think the names even sound like they're definitions. So what is a crystalline solid? There's a very distinct, regular pattern of the particles that make up a solid. Um, that's what makes beautiful crystals, is because there's a real regular array of the atoms and molecules. An amorphous solid would um, has kind of a random or disordered arrangement of the atoms. It's, they're still closely packed. So it still has general properties of a solid, but you don't get the beautiful, shiny crystals. You get what we call more of an amorphous, or um, amorphous just means irregular, not defined. Um, but all of these, again, all solids have a fixed volume and a fixed shape. Unless you melt them, of course, but in general as they are. Liquid matter they still have a fixed volume, so if you start out with 100 milliliters of a liquid, regardless of what you do with it, you're always going to have 100 mils, because liquids are not compressible. You can't change their volume, just like a solid. However, a liquid will change shape. So you can take your 100 milliliters of water, for example, transfer it to a different container, and you, it will assume the shape of the container. So that's what we mean... Um, when we say that liquids do not have a fixed shape. Liquids again can flow because the molecules have enough room between them to slide past one another. And finally a gas. The big thing to know about a gas is it's compressible. There's quite a bit of space in between the atoms and molecules and so we can confine it to from a larger space to a smaller space. So the volume is not fixed, nor is the shape. Gases will take up whatever shape of the container they're in, as well as take up whatever volume they're put in. Spread out as much as you will let them.